Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today I will be interviewing Rebecca McKendry. She is the co-writer, co-director of the new indie horror film, holiday horror film for that matter, All the Creatures Were Stirring. She also is the co-host of the horror podcast Shockwaves, which is where I found out about her. And she used to work for Fangoria Magazine back in the day. And I'm going to have her on the show today to talk about all things horror. Find out what she's all about, uh, what her favorite horror movies are, and how she got into the industry. And I'm very intrigued to um, talk about all the creatures we're stirring and about holiday horror films in general. And it's going to be a pretty cool show. I'm always looking to find open-minded women who love horror and talk to them about horror. I'm, I'm always down to talk to everybody about horror, but especially women. So, uh, yeah, here is my new interview with Rebecca McKendry. Hi, Rebecca. Hey, Tommy, how you doing? I'm great. How are you? Doing excellent. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for taking the time. Finally. <laughs> I'm sorry. It took so long. This is just a crazy time of year. And we knew with the film coming out, it would be batty. So plus I was shooting another one. Oh, wow. Oh, well. Yeah. So, but I'm glad we were able to finally make it work. Yeah. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Awesome. Oh, my God. So, when did your interest in horror begin? Oh, gosh, I was a kid. Um, so, going, like, way back, I've always really, really gravitated towards horror, um, or I'll say scary content more than anything else. Um, my mom was a Star Trek nerd. She still is. <laughs> um, so, I grew up kind of watching all this Star Trek stuff in the background. Right. I was always really into the alien episodes um, and monster episodes more than anything else. And my mom realized this really early on and started kind of just letting me watch what I wanted to watch. Um, my parents were ex-hippies, um, still are, and never really <laughs> controlled or censored me. As long as my grades were good and I didn't get in trouble in school, they never really controlled what I was watching media-wise. Um, I mean, they wouldn't, of course, like let me watch porn or anything, but aside from that, <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't have much, um, there was no one really censoring me. And so... I watched, um, it started with things like Monster Squad or Ghoulies or Critters um, when yeah. I was still like in elementary <clears throat> school. And um, by the time I hit like fifth grade, I remember in fifth grade I watched Hellraiser for the first time. Which you shouldn't, I mean like looking back, I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe I watched that in fifth grade. Like I picked up on nothing. All I knew was like crazy monsters and walls. <laughs> um, but I absolutely loved it. And, yeah, it just continued from there. By the time I was in high school, I had seen every video that was in my local video store, every one of the horror sections. So my parents let me get a card, a video store card, in a <clears> town <throat> um, about 45 minutes away. And when I was 16 and got a car, I was allowed to go once a week to the video store that was 45 minutes away to rent other stuff because they had a lot more exploitation titles. So I was driving to this place called the Video Vault in Alexandria, Virginia, and that's where, like, Everything came to life, um, and I really started getting some weird, obscure titles, and I was still in high school then, so horror has always been my jam. Oh, my God. You and I are so much alike. I grew up <laughs> with free-spirited parents who were, who were they went through hippie phases, but they weren't hippies per se, and I, from the time I was a year old, they had me watching The Shining. That was my first horror movie. Um yeah. I, I, I saw every movie at my video store. Exploitation was my favorite genre. I was like the only one in the world who knew exploitation movies at my school and loved them. I watched USA Up All Night, all that shit. Oh, yeah. Night Flight was a big one for me. Um, yeah. I don't remember what channel that used to be on, but I watched a ton of Night Flight. And I shouldn't call my parents hippies. Like, we grew up devoid of spirituality of any type. There was not a crystal to be found. Yeah. We just definitely had this very 1960s, like, do what you want and be who you are attitude. Um, like, still be successful, don't fuck around, but be who you want to be. And so that's kind of how I came about with everything is no one ever told me not to. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Night Flight was actually on USA before Up All Night. And I remember oh, okay. I remember watching Fantastic Planet on on flight Night Flight when I was like three. And that move, that cartoon movie freaked me out. Night 
Night Flight was both my cinematic and my musical influence because it's how I discovered metal, mm-hmm. um, which later on went to be kind of my go-to um, musical genre and still is. And then it's also where my love of mu- movies came about because it was just this weird, arty, sometimes exploitive, sometimes international. It was just like all of this crazy stuff that I would not see anywhere else. And I loved that show so much. Hell Yes. Do you remember the first horror movie you saw? Well, it depends on what you consider horror. Like, I remember seeing something wicked this way come, super young. Um, Mm -hmm. My mom, again, she was a sci-fi nerd. She was huge into Bradbury. And so um, I remember seeing um, something, the movie version of something wicked this way comes with Jonathan Winters. Like, I was probably maybe five or six. Mm -hmm. And, um, like, it depends. Because then I remember seeing Monster Squad. I remember watching when I was in probably third or fourth grade. Um, (laughs) Bullies, Critters, um, some of those, like, really kind of early 80s horror films um, that were a little bit more accessible as a kid. I think the first one that I saw that, like, really, like, fucking terrified the crap out of me was probably Jaws. Yeah. Um, And, again, I was still in middle school because we had a pool in our backyard and um, by the time that I was in, like, third or fourth grade, I refused to get in the pool. Um, but I remember my parents renting the VHS of Jaws, and um, that they, they, you know, had seen it at drive-ins much long ago, but they rewatched it when we got our first VCR in the early 80s. And I remember watching that with them and just being suddenly like, holy fuck, what the hell? Like, I knew <laughs> yeah. about sharks, but I never knew about sharks. Not that that's in any way accurate, but it completely messed me up for, like, an entire summer. I would just <clears throat> win our swimming pool. I was determined that the um, the tree shadow on the, the pool itself, which was only four and a half feet deep, but that was clearly a giant shark. So, yeah, that, that definitely messed me up for a summer. So most likely I would say, like, the first, I'll call it, horror film that, like, scared me was Jaws. Yeah, The Shining was my first horror movie when I was a year old. It fucked me up. My parents then would not let me watch horror again for the rest of my days, but I did. I wa- they, by the time I got to eight years old and I was doing well in school, they let me stay up on the weekends where I'd watch USA Up all night, and then in the summertime I'd be up every single night and I'd be watching horror. I'd be watching Friday the 13th movies. I'd be watching trauma movies, Every everything that there was and everything exploitation. And I still have the tape that The Shining was on, but in 1987, we taped it over for Back to the Future, my favorite movie of all time. (laughs) And if you rewind it right at the beginning, just before the PG graphics come up, you can see Shelley Duvall talking to the doctor, and it's fucking spooky. Oh, wow. Yeah. Still have that tape. Yeah, it's, it's pretty fucking cool. Uh, so what are your favorite horror movies? Um, well, that in itself changes weekly. Like, if you ask me day to day what's my favorite horror movie, it's going to change every other day depending on kind of where my brain is. Um, Suspiria is usually um, always up there. Like, I, one of my friends, Alric Kane, does a thing called The Handshake Five, which is like the five movies that you tell somebody um, who is just meeting you. And Suspiria is kind of my most consistent um, because that was one of the first movies that I remember – watching and suddenly going, I want to see how that's made, or I want to see a little bit more like the first one where I wanted to be more than just an audience member in it. And so Suspiria is always up there. Um, let's see, was that five horror movies or five just movies? Uh, your favorite your favorite horror movies, yeah. Horror movies, okay, cool. I was going to say Vanishing Point. Not a horror movie, but definitely one that has been like... That's a great movie, yeah. On me. Yeah, um, so other favorite horror movies, um, and again, it changes day to day, but I'll say, like, I love sleazier stuff, like Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. I'm, <laughs> I love that movie so much. It gets so fucking bonkers at the end, Yeah. Um, and I just love it. And then I also love, I'll call it campier horror, um, things like Ticks is one that I usually will throw in there somewhere. It's not like by any means is it the best horror movie ever made. Not by any stretch of the imagination. It's just fun. It is something that I have fun returning to. The Burbs is a big one for me as well. Um, <laughs> not even I'm not even sure you would consider it a horror film, but The Burbs was wildly <laughs> influential um, when I was a kid, and I still watch it regularly. I'd say that that's one that I probably watch I would likely say yearly. Um, 
Demons is a good one. And oh. also a lot of Giallo stuff, actually, now that I'm listening to myself. Oh, my um, God. I love Demons. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, I, I will rewatch that anytime. Um, Deep Rising. Um, mm-hmm. Again, campy, 1990s kind of shecky in its delivery with the comedy and everything. And the monster is heavily cg but I just, it, it's what I love in a movie. It's giant monsters, explosions, outlandish situations, and it makes me eat popcorn and grin at the end. And I, I just love it. So, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, I my favorites, uh, Friday the 13th is my favorite slasher movie. Um, the Howling is my favorite werewolf movie. Dawn of the Dead is my mm-hmm. favorite zombie movie. I got way too many vampire movies, just to name one. There's so many great ones. Um, yeah, for vampires, I tend to go with the ones um, that are kind of, I'll call them more muted, like where the characters are questioning if they're vampires or not. Like, I really love Suzanne and Habit or Romero's Martin. Like, I love these when they're more oh, yeah. character studies than they are. I mean, Lost Boy picks up all the time. But um, I always love vampires as kind of these poetic character studies on the human psyche and questioning who you are. Yeah, speaking of Martin, I interviewed John Amplis last week. It was a fucking honor, I'll tell you. I was just mm-hmm. I was just shaking like a leaf on a tree, but I played it cool, and he, he made me laugh. He entertained me. He was a great guy. That's awesome. Yeah, but yeah, I also love Charlie Band movies. Like he did this one movie called The Alchemist that not a lot of people don't don't uh, remember that one. And there's very little written about it on the internet. All I know is it was shot in '81. It came out in '86 for some reason, and it's just one of those movies of his that he doesn't talk about. But I, I like it a lot. Yeah, kind of. I mean, Gloomy <clears throat> is definitely like one of my go-to's. But even things like. You know, some of his lesser-known ones that he all shot in that castle in Romania um, that yeah. all kind of look the same. They're always fun. That's one of the nice things about Charlie Van. Like, his movies from that time period, at least, they're just all fun. Yeah, they're great. I love Crawl Space. I love mm-hmm. Terror Vision. Uh, Trancers, which is sci-fi, but... Trancers, I want to love Trancers. That one's not quite as much... Um, that one didn't do it for me as much. I, I have um, friends who love, like, the entire series. Like, we'll watch every single one of the Transfers films. And I've tried. And that one's just not my bag. But um, I love everything else he's done. And usually, if something is sci-fi horror, I'm totally there. Like, the movie The Hidden, um, mm-hmm. sci-fi horror, and it kind of along the same lines as Transfers, Screamers, um, I absolutely love. But, yeah, Transfers was just not uh, not my favorite ca- ca- um Charlie Band movie. Have you ever seen Eliminators? I don't think so. Does that have another title? No. Um, okay, Charlie Band did it with the same guys who wrote Trancers, Danny Bilson and Paul DeMeo. I interviewed Danny Bilson a month ago. Great guy too. Um, it's kind of a, it's kind of a hybrid of um, of robot sci-fi and like Indiana Jones type serials. And it's really, really funny and entertaining. It's got Denise Crosby from Star Trek Next Generation and Pet mm-hmm. Cemetery, and um, Andrew Prine, and this guy Patrick Reynolds. That was his only movie. He plays the main robot, and um, I'm actually interviewing him um, after Christmas. He uh, got into the anti-smoking industry, and ironically, his grandfather is like the founder of, I think, um, Winston cigarettes or something. His his grandfather was a cigarette mogul, and he's an anti-cigarette mogul. Ironically, <laughs> well, I'm curious if that's why he would do it. It's like the, the ghost of the father. So yeah, wow. but the Eliminators is great though. I have it on VHS. It's a great. I will movie. definitely have to check that one out. Yeah, did you ever have a crush on anybody in horror? Oh yeah, I mean when I was, um, and it was always just like acting. Like, when I remember seeing The Lost Boys when I was in middle school, I thought that the guy playing Paul um, was just absolutely adorable, and he passed away a couple of years ago, which is very yeah. sad. Martin, I always thought that um, from Martin from Martin Romero um, was just absolutely um, dreamy, which is weird, because he's a serial killer, but still, he had some, some very cute qualities to him in the movie. Um, so, yeah, of course, that came up when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Linnea Quigley was a big one for me, and I told her, and she thought that was so sweet. And 
uh, she interviewed me for a documentary a year ago, and I was just so nervous, but I'm so I'm, I'm so anxious to see it uh, when it when the documentary is finally put together. If my scene has got to be just the most hilarious one, we we had a lot of fun shooting it. Yeah, I feel like she was like America's crush. Like every boy in America had a thing for her. Yeah, it was for me. It was her, Michelle Bauer, um, Laura Park Lincoln. I told Laura last week, and she. She thought that was sweet also, and a couple, a couple others, but yeah, Linnea was the biggest one for me. Do you think that horror, in terms of originality, has become antiquated now? Um, no, not in any regard. Like, even now, I'm just looking over my top ten list for this year, which we're getting ready to do on Shockwave tonight. And the stuff that I'm looking over um, that, you know, made my top ten list from this year, not a single one is a remake. Um, only one is a sequel, and the majority that are on there are indie stuff that is just kind of out of freaking left field. Um, mm-hmm. Like Mandy um, is on there, or Cam, um, and these are just movies, or The Ritual, um, and these are just movies that they're not connected to anything else. They're completely original news stories. They're not even a relatable subgenre. Like, you can't even look at these films and say, oh, it's a slasher, or oh, it's a werewolf movie, or torture porn. They don't fit into this. So for me, 2018 was an incredibly original year in horror, and especially when we were touring with um, the film that we did, All the Creatures Were Stirring, we were doing all of these different festivals across the U.S. and seeing all of the different films that played at each of the festivals. Nothing was like anything else. And so the amount of originality that I'm seeing come out of the indie markets is just insane. Um, the only thing that I saw as even a remote trend this year was, I'll call them family horrors. Um, <laughs> things like Hereditary, I think, definitely kind of kick-started the trend. But I saw a couple of other ones kind of following the suit with, oops, mom just died. Oops, she had crazy secrets. Oops, now we're all possessed by the devil type stuff. But even that, none of them kind of lived up to where Heredity pushed it. Um, but aside from that, I mean, what's the hot trend right now? Who the hell knows? What we're seeing right now is just kind of a big hodgepodge of a bunch of original stuff that nobody even knows where it's coming from. And even the stuff that we saw coming out of the studios this year, we did see some sequels. We saw Purge. We saw Insidious. But at the same time, we saw The Quiet One. Um, like, mm-hmm. where did that come from? It's completely original concepts, giant monsters. We saw Annihilation, which I still haven't figured out what the fuck is going on in that movie. I loved it, but mm-hmm. I don't know what was going on. And so I think that we're actually in a really good point of originality right now. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I see stuff that's that's that I just think is too dark. And, like, I think a lot of horror movies are just not as fun as they used to be. I mean, there's some yeah. exceptions. Like, I loved Happy Death Day. I thought that was great. See, that is definitely a trend right now. Um, or not a trend, it's, it's kind of, uh, there's pushback against it. So the movie that we just um, released last week, All the Creatures Were Stirring, yes. is a horror comedy. It's a weird horror comedy. Um, and at, while we were trying to sell it, every single, um, a lot of the people that we would talk to were like, horror comedies just don't sell. And then we would learn about horror comedies from past, years that we thought were amazing. Like, I loved the movie Deathgasm so much. I thought it was ridiculously fun. It was one of my favorite movies from that year. It may have been in my top five. And when we suddenly hear, like, yeah, you know, it just kind of is lukewarm in the States. I'm like, are you kidding me? That movie was just sick. It was wonderful. But horror comedies, it's a hard thing to get right. It's it's a hard mix of kind of kind of trying to mix a darker tone in comedy. And right now, especially when you're looking at things like Netflix, mm-hmm. that is not something that, you know, that they're seeing do really, really well. And so therefore, investors aren't really investing a lot. And so even something like Happy Death Day, it was not marketed as a horror comedy. It was marketed as a straight slasher. The comedic side was kind of buried. And then you get in there and there's a couple jokes and you're laughing and it's fun. But yeah, where horror, at least in in kind of trends right now, where horror seems to be living is in these darker, serious, um, very real tones. A lot of them social in nature, yeah. which is kind of reflective mm-hmm. of everything that's going on right now. We're not seeing a lot of kind of really fun, vibrant, light, have a good time horror. That said, I saw Anna in the Apocalypse a couple nights ago, and that was a freaking blast. So um, hopefully the tides will be turning. Of course, that's coming from overseas, so that may just be an international trend. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I got back into horror two years ago after having some dark shit happen to me. Um, had a pretty bad car accident a couple of years ago that made me see my life differently. And then I started pursuing uh, my passions and my interests and stuff, and it gave me confidence and all that. And I got back into horror. I started going to conventions and started seeing the newer movies. I only saw one movie in 2016 that was the first one that moved me in about 15 years, Jackson Stewart's Beyond the Gates. Sorry, could you repeat that? You cut out there. Sorry. Oh, which part? Uh, you were telling me the name of the movie. Oh, um, uh, Jackson Stewart's Beyond the Gates. Oh, yeah, Jackson Stewart's a friend of mine. Yes, he's uh, been a guest on the show. He and I get along great because we're near the same age, and we both, like, just like you and I, we, lo- we, lo- we love all the same stuff, you know? And yeah. We, we get along so great. And, um, yeah, just, like, I felt that movie spoke to me and spoke to, you know, like, all the classic horror movies I grew up watching and all the exploitation movies I grew up watching. I fell in love with it, and I'm, I'm still obsessed with it. I, like, I try to watch it as often as I can now, uh, still recovering from my accident, and I'm on Netflix constantly and everything. And yeah, that, and then... Um, did you see uh, Slasher.com? I have not seen that one, no. Yeah, with Jewel Shepard and Ben Kaplan, who's going to be on the show on Friday. That's a really great movie. It's like a, it's kind of like a, a modern-day Texas Chainsaw Massacre with a couple other homages in it. It's pretty good. Hills Have Eyes stuff. That's very cool. And, um, I mean, last year I liked, you know, uh, the remake of It. I liked uh, mm-hmm. Get Out. Um, stuff. Yeah, and of course, Happy Death Day, which I mentioned. I mean, I mean, there's there's certain things I like though, but I've been very picky. You know, just just like I like the lighthearted stuff as opposed to the really dark stuff that I can't get into. And I like dark, but just some things are just really too dark for me. Mm-hmm. You know, but um, yeah. So you used to work at, um, at Fangoria. How long were you there for? I was at Fangoria um, for all. Most 13 years. Um, I started out there as an intern, mm-hmm. and uh, I met Mike Gingold at a film festival, um, and I was moderating a couple panels and met him afterwards. And he asked if I was interested in maybe doing some research work for Fangoria, and um, I went in and I got the internship. And I was like 20 at the time. I had just finished my undergrad degree, and I was in a master's program in New York City. And um, I worked at Fangoria for the next like 13 years, um, and so I moved my way. I was an intern for a while, and then I was working at the radio show, and then I became um, an associate producer on the radio show, and then I moved to writer, and then I was doing research, and then I moved um, to executive director of marketing, which is where I spent the bulk of my time that I was there. I was executive director of marketing for almost 10 years. And um, so, yeah, I was in, uh, as one of the, the main people at Fangoria for a good decade, um, which was awesome. And even still, I'm still on as a consultant with the new um, company and everything and helping them out when they need it. Well, was this in New York? Yeah, I lived in New York for the bulk of it. And then for the last couple of years, I moved out here to L.A. Um, but for most of it, I was in New York City. Wow. Yeah, I've had uh, Tim, I've had uh, Tony Timponi on the podcast, and I've met him at Monster Palooza last year. Uh, he's a great guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm glad Fangoria's come back. I, I wish Weekend of Horrors would come back. That that was like the only horror convention in my childhood. My parents never wanted to take me to it because they because they, they weren't into horror and stuff. I mean, eventually they found out that I was watching horror and they didn't care, but they just weren't into that thing. And now I've I'm just obsessed with the convention scene now. Yeah, no, Texas Frightmare is <laughs> my favorite convention now. Um, but yeah, for a stretch, I mean, when I started with Fangoria for the bulk of my tenure there, we did four to eight conventions a year. Yeah. And so, and I was at every single one of them. So we would do a convention usually like every two months. We had a convention of some type. And so, and then I ended up producing some of the conventions, and they were giant, massive undertakings, but always a blast. And then we parted ways um, with the the company who was kind of um, handling all of our marketing and the ticket sales and stuff. And then we never really got them back up and running. But they were, um, for for much of my time at Fangoria, they were like a massive part of my life where I was 
constantly traveling for them. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. I found out about you on um, Shockwave's podcast. How long have you been doing that now? Um, well, we've been there for, well, in some form for six years. So Shockwave um, actually started as a show called Killer POV mm-hmm. um, that we used to do on this smaller um, network, which is no more, called Geek Nation. And we did Killer POV for, I guess it was about three years, or three to four years. And then Blumhouse bought us, and we went over to Blumhouse, and we changed the name to Shockwave, and we've been there for almost three years now as well. We've been on, um, uh, yeah, I'd say a good couple of years there. Um, but yeah, we've known, we've been doing podcasts together for about six years now. And then prior to that, Elric and I had a show um, called Inside Horror that we did on a network called The Stream. So I worked with Elric there. And then I've worked with both Ryan and Rob um, through Fangoria. So we all knew each other beforehand going in a little bit. Are you talking about the stream.tv? That's the one. Yeah, Elric and I did Inside Horror on that for a year prior to Killer POV. Yeah, my friend Anastasia Washington used to have a show on there. Yeah, it was fun. We always had a blast doing that show. Um, So, yeah, and then it kind of morphed into Killer POV. Mm Mm-hmm. I like the one you guys did with John Landis. That was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Landis. Uh, we've had him. We had him on Inside Horror, and then we also had him recently on Shockwave. Um, and he was one of my favorite Shockwave episodes. He spoke from the back of his head the entire time, and we never had a clue what he was going, like where he was going with the conversation yeah. or um, what he was going to say. He was just a real impulsive speaker, but it made for a fantastic interview. Yeah, he, he was on Kevin Pollack's uh, show for just under three hours. <laughs> yeah, no, that's how it was. And even after we stopped recording, he kept going for another hour telling old Hollywood stories. And we were like, I didn't even stop recording, man. He was just so fun to talk to. Yeah, uh, he's a hero of mine. I love that guy. Mm-hmm. So you finally made your own movie. Uh, all the creatures well, actually, were stirring. I've been making stuff for a long time. This one Oh, okay. one of the first ones to get attention. And I've already shot one since then. Um, so, yeah, I've been working on stuff for a long time through Fangoria. Like, I made TV shows with Fangoria because we have Fango TV. I produced TV shows for the Nerdist Network, um, some of their horror content. Yeah. And I've made a ton of music videos and short films. And then um, we decided um, two years ago that we wanted to go ahead and do a feature. And we uh, had met two fantastic producers um, in L.A. Morgan, Peter Brown and Joe Wicker, who we met at a festival, Mm -hmm. that wanted to see um, what features we had and were interested in working with us on one under a very tight budget restraint. And uh, so we went through everything that we had to see what would fit within that budget. And um, we were kind of like, okay, well, we could do a Christmas horror anthology and shoot it here in Los Angeles. And that's how all the creatures were starring came to be. And um, since then, I have shot another movie, which is a made-for-TV movie, and I'm not allowed to say the network yet, but it's called yeah. Granny's Home. It's a different <clears throat> thriller, is uh, what it's referred to as. And um, so that will be coming up in uh, early 2019. So, yeah. Um, but All the Creatures We're Stirring, it's a horror comedy. It's definitely a black comedy. It's weird. It's funky. It's um, set in a really experimental theater, which is very much me and Dave, like it's it's definitely my and Dave's um, style, and uh, it was it's super fun, super quick shoot. But um, yeah, it's available on all POD platforms right now, as well as DVD, and you can find it in Walmart and Target, and it'll be on Blu-ray in January. Wow, is it? Uh, ju- judging from the synopsis, though, is it is it a, is it a horror anthology movie? Yeah, it's an anthology. Um, mm-hmm. So that was part of the reason that. We um, picked that project is a lot of the people that we knew we wanted to work with kind of have day jobs here in Hollywood, like Constance Wu is on Fresh Off the Boat, Amanda Fuller is on uh, Last Man Standing, and so we knew that we would need to find something that we could kind of do on weekends that we could shoot when these people were not working, Right. and so it wasn't like we could ask them to take three weeks off from work so we could go shoot a film, so we needed to find something segmented, and so that it, it morphed itself into a horror anthology. Yeah, I wrote a horror anthology movie. Um, so I write, I write horror screenplays and stuff, and I wrote this this horror anthology. Each story is a homage to like uh, has a different tone and a different homage to like '80s horror anthology movies and shows. Like, there's a Tales from the Crypt. There's a 
uh, Cat's Eye, Creep Show, uh, Dead Time Stories, uh, Steven Spielberg's Amazing Stories, The Hitchhiker, all those horror anthology shows I grew up watching is like homaged in this script I wrote. And that's awesome. Yeah. And it's, that's like a dream project. I'd like to get all my horror movie buddies that I've interviewed on the show, all the horror legends in like in this thing, and like create like a Pulp Fiction of horror, you know, type horror anthology movie, you know, one of these days. Mm-hmm. And I have another. Well, that's all it took. I mean, the the, the finding the funding was um, by far the most difficult part. But even still, I mean, like we worked within a super super tight small budgetary range. And um, once we kind of understood, like, what we were capable of and what we could afford, mm-hmm. then, you know, getting the project together and things like that, it fell rather quickly, and it was just a matter of staying on top of it and, and getting everything done. Um, so it, don't quit. There's, there's never going to be a perfect storm. Dave and I kept saying, like, can't we just wait till we have a million dollars? And we quickly realized <laughs> that, you know, we may never have a million dollars, or we will. Who the fuck knows? Let's just go make a movie. And we did, and it's gotten us work since. So it's well worth it. Yeah. I mean, Deborah Voorhees is doing an Indiegogo on her uh, Friday the 13th homage, uh, mm-hmm. which I contributed to and ho- and I auditioned for it. Hopefully I'll, I'll have a part in it and stuff, but I support that greatly and everything. I wanted to ask you, the, I saw the other day on Facebook, you posted, it was like the top 25 best horror Christmas movies of all time, right? And yep. You know, the usual suspects were on there, Black Christmas, Silent Night, Deadly Night, Jack Frost, Santa Claus, all that stuff. Two of my favorites were not on there. To All a Good Night and Christmas Evil were not on there. Do do you think, and this is going to be a funny question considering you just made a Christmas-themed horror movie, do you think do you think that the, the, the Christmas horror movie genre is, like, dead now? It's played out? It's like everyone's done it? Yeah, I, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Oh my God. I, I interviewed Jennifer Runyon and I asked her, uh, I asked her about two all a good night. Right. She told me she did not know that Harry Reams was a porn star. Right. <laughs> and I said to her, how did you find out? Did, did he take his dick out in front of everybody? She was, she could not stop breathing. She was laughing so hard at that. <laughs> yeah. 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 I love I love that one though. That's like one of the few horror Christmas movies that doesn't have snow in it too. Cause it- I um actually yeah, ours does not have snow because it's set in Los Angeles. Um, well, that was too. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, it turns into a terrifying movie. Um, I always like the ones that are kind of, yeah, it 
happens to be Christmas, but here's the crazy shit going on. Those are always really fun for me. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with that. Yeah, <clears throat> I just I just love holiday themed horror movies in general. You know, I mean, they just came out with a Hanukkah one. Yeah. I heard that there was a Hanukkah one coming, though. Mm-hmm. It's got Sid Haig in it and a couple other uh, horror legends. And, yeah, that looks like it's going to be pretty funny. I'm going to check that one out. Yeah. Well, Rebecca, uh, th- thank you so much. I, I hope we meet someday. I, I think you and I are like long lost. You- we're like long lost besties. <laughs> yeah, where are you based? I live in Reading, and you know I go down to Los Angeles uh, quite frequently. I'm trying to move down there. It hasn't been easy, but I'm trying to make it happen. It's an expensive town, but it's I love it here. It's a blast, so it's it's kind of worth the uh, the effort. So, well, thank you so much for having me on your show. Yes, I'd love to have you back again when your schedule is not so hectic. And Excellent. Yes, let me get through the next uh, week, and then um, then I have a nice break. I'm really looking forward to. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me on, and good luck. Yes, I hope uh, the movie is successful. I'm, I'm going to see it um, when I can. Happy holidays, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Rebecca McKendry. Ain't she a sweetheart? Thank you so much, Rebecca. By God, I you know, it's funny. I, I never thought that there was people out there like me until I got back into the horror scene. And I'm just so damn lucky uh, with people I'm meeting. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I'd love to talk to you more in the future, of course. Um, If you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.